Okay, th let me start this out with some of my thoughts. We all know and we all talk about our Navajo enterprises. And so, does anybody know which, what was our first Navajo enterprise? I don't have to answer myself, but does anybody know who our first Navajo enterprise was? And when were they started? Does anybody have an idea? I know, I know. Liddell? Anybody? Liddell. I believe it was NQA in 1959. 19... 59. Liddell says Navajo Tribal Utility Authority in 1959. Anybody else? Navajo Arts and Crafts. I, I think that was one of the first. No? Milton. Navajo Oil and Gas, 1923. Oh, okay. All right. Ah, okay. I, 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 think, I think it was the NTUA. And the reason for that is I, I was on the board for 10 years, and NTUA got started because back in the day, the BIA, with all their facilities, they actually were in the electrical business. They were basically our NTUA. So there were discussions back then, what, in the 50s, I'm not sure who was our leadership, but they said, you know, we can take that over. And so NTUA started with providing power and basically electricity in the Windrock area because that was a BIA function back in the day. And so slowly, slowly. And um, okay, another question. Are enterprises are considered subsidiaries or extensions of the Navajo government. So what does that mean? Are they taxable or non-taxable when it comes to federal tax liabilities? Taxable or non-taxable? Does anybody know? Our lawyers ran away. They're non-taxable. If you read the IRS code, it says tribal governments and their subdivisions. I think it's the word. They're subdivisions. They're not subject to federal income taxes. So, which means, in two way, arts and crafts, NAPI, all those others, they aren't subject to, to taxes because categorically they're considered a part of the Navajo government. So, next question, and I'll, I'll, st I'll stop there. Are our enterprises profits or nonprofit entities? Uh, they're nonprofit. Are they profit? In, in, in the scheme of nonprofit or for profit, what are our enterprises considered in your minds? Okay. It, they're nonprofits because if you look at the IRS codes, nonprofits aren't subject to taxes, right? So our Navajo enterprises and categorically tribal enterprises around the country are nonprofits, even though they make a profit. Now, we all, even if you're a nonprofit, you make profit, right? You look at your bottom, it's not called profit, it's called What's, what's the term for government accounting? Uh, a positive proceeds after, you know, I forget all my, where's our accountants? Um, but anyhow, even our nonprofits make a profit. And what's, a, what's profit? Revenues minus expenses. That difference is called a profit. But when you look at the tax scheme, nonprofit entities do not have to pay federal income taxes. Okay, but categorically, if you're not making a profit, then you shouldn't be in business too, by the way, you know, because you need, you need enough revenue to support your expenses. So anyhow, kind of food for thought as we go through this. All right, so that lends itself to today. And I know everybody bashes, and I do, I used to, and I still do, even though I used to run one. I, actually, I ran several in the past. Um, do enterprises help or hurt us? And for me, I believe that, that there is a need for enterprises um, because of their nonprofit status, which means they're not subject to taxes. If we privatize our enterprises, for example, well, actually, NNGE can't be privatized, by the way, because the Navajo government has to run and own gaming. So 
So we can't privatize gaming, but maybe the other enterprises, we can. Um, but you have a profit margin lift because you don't have to pay taxes. On the other side though, I think the argument is that do enterprises gobble up the work and take all the work, which basically is, is a monopoly and it puts, puts, they're so competitive that our small businesses, our Navajo owned business aren't allowed, you know, to, to get the business done, to be able to contract with the nation and so forth. You know, do they, do they hog the show? As you know, I'll use my very educated term, do they hog the show or not? We don't know. So we're gonna basically go into that discussion. And so today we have Liddell Davies, who is the interim director for the Dene Chamber of Commerce. We have Mr. Milton Bluehouse, who is an instructor with the Dene College, and he does other work as he said. And then we have Mr. Brian Parrish, who is the interim chief executive officer for the Navajo Nation Gaming Enterprise. And then we have Carl Jim, who is with the Navajo Nation Ga Gaming Enterprise. And what's your title these days, Carl? Director of Brand Management. Brand Management. Mr. Jim is there. So, um, so I I'm going to turn the mic over to you all. And let's see, what time is it here? Sorry about that. 3.37. I will like to have each of you for five minutes talk about, you know, who you are, what you are kind of thing, and your, your initial thoughts on our enterprise question. Okay? So, ladies first? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here is Liddell Davies. Can I use this one? Yeah. Go ahead. Hello. Yate, everyone. Liddell Davies, you know, send a kin initially. No, that at the net a bushes chain. Touching you just a chair, dog, kia, ani, dashinella. My mother was the late Claudine Bates Arthur, and so I have to confess that I, I have sort of a legal uh, perspective on some of the things I might be saying this afternoon. But um, in my role as the interim chair for the Dinette Chamber of Commerce, um, which I've been, I've served in this role for about a year now, but I've been involved with the chamber for the past eight years. And um, with respect to the Navajo Nation enterprises, whether they hurt or help, I think that's a really uh, a tricky question. It's a trick question. It, it's, a, uh, it's like a double-edged sword. In the beginning, I think in the early 1970s and back to the 60s when the enterprises were first uh, thought about and created, they, were, they served a really good purpose. And, that, and we, were, we were smaller. We were a much smaller nation. And at that time, it was very important to have Navajo opportunities for Navajo employees. And that was the that was the purpose of setting up these enterprises. And you can look in their charters, you can look in the legislation that originally, um, where they were originally created by the council, and their purpose was to train Navajos to do particular jobs in electricity, the ele electrical industry, utility industry, um, water, arts and crafts. All of these things were things that were, it was a good idea, but now, we're very, very large. There's lots and lots of Navajos out there who don't have, um, aren't able to participate in the utilities, uh, and, or I'm sorry, in the enterprises and the opportunities they afford. I also think that the uh, enterprises have, have grown a little bit too big for their bridges, as they say. And when it comes to private business development, which is the backbone of any economy, you have competition. Well, we all know that our enterprises compete with our own Navajo businesses. For instance, if I wanted to start a broadcasting company, I, I could probably do that if I had the capital, but I'm not able to go to the council, like our own broadcasting company owned by the nation, and say, I need eight million dollars. Can I have that to start a business? I want a radio station. No, but KTNN can go to the council 
and every few years get millions and millions of dollars to keep operating. But me, as a private business owner, I w I'm, I'm not afforded the same opportunity. That competition with our own government is something that is that we, we and our leaders need to look at very closely. And I'm an advocate for tearing the system down. I would like to tear the system down and start from scratch because we're in a different situation now than we were in 1971. 1959, I think it was Raymond Nakai, bless his heart, that, and only those of you who are older than me and I'm old as dirt, remember him, you know? <laughs> so these, in this modern day and age, and this goes back to what um, Joseph Austin was speaking about in his introduction, which was international business. We need to think about going into the 21st century in a way that's productive, in a way that's sustainable, and in a way that allows participation by all of our people who want to be in business. Not just, I need to make a business so that I can contract with NTUA. I don't know how many millions and millions and millions and millions and billions of dollars NTUA has, has been given by the council. But as I said, if you want to be a private co-op, utility co-op, set up your own solar farm because your chapter allowed you through this business site leasing process to do that, you can't do that. NTUA will never let you do that. And that's, that's a problem. So I guess I, from my perspective, I think enterprises hurt us now more than they help us, although they do help us employ pe some people. So um, thank you. I will pass the mic. Mr. Great, thank you, Derek. I appreciate Go it. Go ahead, Mr. Blayhouse. Just recap the question uh, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I explained a little bit more about uh, who I am, uh, who I've um, been educated, but I've also worked with um, the uh, president and his administration as the former um, de deputy uh, chief of staff, and also um, I've worked in and out of federal agencies and on Capitol Hill for you know on and off since the late uh, 1990s, and so. Um, with that background, I also wanted to share with you that um, the ideas and the thoughts that I that I that I generate that I um, that I that I share with you and, and the ideas that I receive you know, all come from my my, my uh, grandmother, Dr. Winika, my mother, Irma Bluehouse, and stories of my great grandfather, Chi Dodge. And so there was always these conversations about public service and these conversations about you know taking um, time and being careful about how uh, we provide services uh, in a manner that benefits those most in need in our communities. And so when I think about that background and the Navajo enterprises, one thing that's quite fascinating for me is that, and, 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 and was touched on and, and just a moment ago by Ms. Davidson, so the issue is that they were created in a time when economic development was, in a sense, an adventurous journey for a lot of tribal governments. And they were looking at the availability of resources on the ground at that time with the background of federal support. And so what we do see now is an enterprise system that um, at the time of its creation was really a creature of necessity um, to begin the modernization of the Navajo economy, both in agricultural terms as well as in mining terms and also in artisanship, and then later in utility development and so on and so forth. And so when I think about the current needs for today, I don't think that the question is really whether the enterprises hurt us or they help us. I think the question is, for me, are the enterprises um, doing what they need to do to grow? Now, I think that generally the question is yes, uh, but more specifically when we look at specific enterprises like NAPI, or we look at specific enterprises like Navajo Arts and Crafts, or Navajo hospitality, so on and so forth, I think that, again, measured against the economic developments nationally right now with fears of inflation and this market that apparently is doing a little bit of a rebound today, but last week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, people were really freaking out across the country about you know, drops in um, the market. Um, and so that being said then, I think that when we look at the, the, the enterprises, the question is, are they ripe for growth? Um, yes, 
again, dependent upon what's going on nationally in terms of the economics and how it impacts individual Navajo peoples and their spending habits. Right now, I'm sorry, am I out of time? No, no, that's, okay. that's my problem, um, sorry. The revenue is being generated over $100 million combined for Navajo Enterprises. And of that, they're employing over 5,000 employees. And so when I think about two things, one, it's about where are those areas for growth? And to be creative here, for example, take Nappy. Can't they, like General Mills, contract with individual farmers throughout the Navajo Nation to grow product and produce for which Nappy would purchase and then use their influence to market the access, to access the market on behalf of regional or individual growers? That's one way to diversify Nappy. Another way might be to look at, say, a co-op for Navajo Arts and Crafts to diversify. Then another thing is that these enterprises are very large, very complex, and certainly they consume products and services. And so the questions are, what can we do in terms of procurement from individual Navajo producers or service providers? Navajo Gaming does a really wonderful deal with the steaks, the beef, and the purchasing from local ranchers of the steaks that they're selling here. That's a good example. But what can Nappy do? What can Navajo Arts and Crafts do? What can other things, like for example, Navajo Hospitality, you have these very interesting things called, um, I don't know, glamping, right? It's glam, glamour camping. Well, why can't they support Navajo families in very picturesque areas of the Navajo Nation in developing and supporting these glamping sites and coordinating it such that they get the financial economic support for it, but then also are, um, they, they have access to the marketing uh, skills and the expertise of, say, DED or of Navajo Gaming, for example. And so it's about creativity in terms of expansion for Navajo Gaming. One, one minute, Milton. Sorry. And so when we think about that, we also have to understand that employees work their entire careers at these enterprises. And of that, more than $60 million is being generated from, for retirement salaries for individuals who work their entire career. And so on the back end, then, it continues to contribute and continues to give. But I think that, like uh, my, 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 my sister Liddell, we're both Chanjia Kine, I think that she's right. We do have to re-examine how enterprises are operating and perhaps rebuild it in a sense that it's diversified so that individuals and communities are participating not only in the services but also the products that are being provided by these enterprises. And so it's about being creative and thinking outside the box. Thank you. Parish. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share information. Uh, with you today. We're very grateful to be on this distinguished panel and also with my uh, colleague and my close friend Carl Jim. Um, our perspective is, is a little bit uh, different. We have a different mission uh, to satisfy and to provide uh, benefits back to the Navajo Nation. First of all, our mission is to create jobs and revenue back to Navajo. Uh, we've worked very hard at that. Our enterprise prior to the pandemic had almost 1,200 employees uh, in 19 different career fields. Uh, you can study the gaming industry as a whole, and what the gaming industry has done, especially in the Indian country, is bring people home. So native peoples back to their native lands, giving them careers and opportunities to grow and develop in 19 or 20 plus career fields. So it's not just a card, uh, somebody dealing cards or fixing a slot machine or serving food. We've got lots of folks behind the scenes that you don't see in all these different career fields that help grow and run this business. So there's tons of opportunity for people. Uh, but some of the things I just want to share real quickly, Navajo was, was late getting into the gaming business. Uh, President Reagan signed the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act into law in 1988 and uh, Navajo Nation uh, opened its first property in 2008, which was Fire Rock uh, in the Church Rock chapter. And so we were, it took Navajo a little while longer to decide to go ahead and get into the business and had tremendous success with Fire Rock. 
the entire enterprise, 100% of this enterprise, was funded, capitalized with debt, with loans from the Navajo Nation. So we pay a tremendous amount of interest and principal back to the nation every year. Those dollars go into the permanent trust fund right now, and so people may say, well, gee, we don't know what Navajo Nation Gaming Enterprise gives back. Well, a big portion of our, of our uh, profit goes back into the permanent trust fund, so we're not just getting money. We're paying money back. We've actually paid more back already than we borrowed in baseline principal, and we still have another 30 years to go. So there's a lot of profit built into that for the Navajo Nation. So just wanted to share that and, and, uh, and help everybody get a feel for how that, what that responsibility is. We also pay sales tax, and we pay sales tax on the buildings that we build. As a matter of fact, the Navajo Blue Travel Plaza, that was a $10 million project. That generated $600,000 in sales tax revenue back to the Navajo Nation. We took that out of the project budget. We have business site leases that we pay constantly. Those monies go into the relocate rehabilitation funds and other specific needs to support the Dana people. Uh, Navajo Nation Department of Public Safety, we pay three quarters of a million dollars a year to DPS for law enforcement services. Um, land transfers, we buy land, it's brought into trust. Uh, just like we did with the Horseman Lodge recently, and those, those land, the value of that land goes back to be held on behalf of the Dene people in the Navajo Nation. We also have a gaming distribution fund, and we put over $23 million into that fund for the chapters to go ahead and apply to Navajo Nation Council and Navajo Nation government in order to receive access to those funds for different economic development projects and needs at the chapter level. So that's a great uh, opportunity to find funding and such through your chapter leadership to find ways to help uh, grow business. Uh, as uh, Milton was sharing a few minutes earlier uh, ago, and we really appreciate, is we have some really important partnerships that we've entered into uh, on the Navajo Nation. Our business is not just gaming. Our primary business is non-gaming. Why do people go visit casinos? Yes, they want to play, but what attracts them to casinos? It's all the non-gaming amenities. It's your brand, it's your culture, it's the individual products that you sell. And so those things are the most important. A slot machine in, at NNGE is the same it is at, at Isleta or a Talking Stick down in Phoenix. They're all the same. Why would people come to you? It's service, it's quality, keeping your places clean, keeping them safe, giving them a good value, and being consistent in terms of delivering those values back to uh, the patron. It's really interesting, the uh, Yahoo, the uh, internet service provider for a long time, so the name, Y-A-H-O-O, -O, Yahoo. What that stands for in, in their culture is you always have other options. And so what they did was they built that into their company culture to remind their team members that, hey, our patrons have other options out there. We can't sit back and say, well, we're doing as good a job as we can, and so please come and, and, and buy our products or frequent our facilities. That doesn't work. Competition is key, and we have to rise to the occasion. Now, the beautiful thing about Navajo is there is no tribe, no tribe in Indian country that has as rich a culture as you do not even close, with the depth, with the breadth, with the meaning, the spirituality. Finding ways to share it in a way that doesn't commercialize it, but it honors it, is something that will connect people to Navajo and to your business, and doing it in a way that's very respectful, but it sets everything on Navajo apart from what the other tribes and the other competition is doing. I've worked in gaming for 33 years. I've been in Indian country for almost 20. I've worked for three different Native American tribes, and Navajo is by far the richest in terms of its culture, and the Dene people are the most wonderful, giving, caring, and service-oriented people that I have ever worked with in commercial or Indian country. And that is our greatest asset. So we're trying to find ways to continue to pull our team members in, engage them, make sure we take good care of them, because if we take good care of our team members, they're gonna take good care of our patrons. So we've working very, very hard to do those types of things. 
I brought uh, Mr. Carl Jim along with us because he developed our Navajo Blue Travel Plaza brand all on his own. We locked him up in a hotel room for three days and said, don't come out until you come up with the brand. And, uh, and he did. And he came up with something that we'd like for him to uh, just share with you and help you understand the, the right. thought process behind it because it connects with people. So um, there's Time. a lot more that this enterprise Time. Prize Time. does with how we generate revenue, how we bring patrons from outside the nation back to Navajo, where they're spending their money, and, and we'll talk about those things as we go we forward. But yep. there's tremendous opportunity to, to work with all of us and create a rising tide effect. And that's what we're here to do. We're not here to, to leapfrog or get ahead or cannibalize anybody's business. We're here to work in partnership. So thank okay. you, Brian. Thank, thank you. you. And may I go to Mr. Jim, sir? Uh, next question. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a little okay. bit here. OK. So. My apologies. Okay, we talked about um, monopolizing, uh, basically not being able to allow for Navajo small businesses. I think I heard about uh, the nation supporting and capitalizing our businesses. Um, I think gaming is, is unique. So, but next question, next question. If you were to clean the slate and you had, you had the option of starting from scratch, would you include the enterprises or not, and how would you do that? And so, because you know, I think we're right now, what we're hearing is either or. Is there is there an in between, or maybe not? So um, let's start with Liddell. With if you had the ability for a clean slate, and you were in charge of the enterprise network or not, what would you do, given what we're hearing today? Liddell. Thank you, Derek. Um, question: If I if I had the if I had the power, <laughs> I would. Um, I I think that yeah, the enterprises uh, they serve they do serve a purpose. But if I were to wipe the slate clean, I think I would start first by removing government officials from the enterprise boards. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of strange, but I think that that's extremely important because if the enterprise is gonna be owned by the government, I think we need uh, non-government insight on the boards as opposed to government people on the boards because they do, they do have a great influence. And sometimes, many times, as we all know, uh, government doesn't understand business, and that's one of our biggest problems, is that our council, our president's office, they don't understand business. And so when they sit on the boards of the enterprises, they make a lot of decisions based on their government experience, which has nothing to do with real life, as, as you know. Um, um, and so I would, I would maybe start there. I would also probably compromise and say, well, we, we have our enterprises, let's, let's um, we don't necessarily have to knock them down and start clean, but we, what we need to do is ensure that Navajo enterprises hire Navajo businesses and to, to be their suppliers of goods and services. Because right now that doesn't happen either. We have very few Navajo businesses who are subs, subcontractors to all of these enterprises. And if we continue to do that, we're, we're cheating our own Navajo businesses. And we, we've heard from many of our presidential candidates, many of our previous administrations that there are no qualified Navajo businesses to do these jobs. I beg to differ. When the CARES Act funding came out and the Business and Artisan Grant Fund uh, round went out, over 6,000 Navajo businesses signed up for the, the, those funds. And it took Navajo Nation Economic Development Office by surprise. They had no idea there were that many Navajo businesses. About 60% of them identified as artisans, so in, in the arts and crafts industry, which is a, a whole other issue, but 
with respect to the enterprises, they need to hire that other 40% Navajo businesses. We have plumbers, we have electricians, we have you know, just the whole gamut of private business suppliers and the Navajo enterprises needs, they need to, they need to be mandated to use Navajo business. The excuse that we don't have qualified Navajo businesses is not, is not an excuse to use anymore. We have plenty of qualified Navajo businesses. So, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, I appreciate that, Derek. Um, so, <laughs> taking a really large panoramic conversation here about whether to wipe the slate clean or start anew, um, or to work with what you have with existing. I would take the conversation about let's work with what we got that's in place now because we've already got the infrastructure in place for business operations and management as well as the revenue generation portions of it. Established markets that have been accessed through these enterprises, whether it's Arts and Crafts or NAPI or even NECA. So if we were to deconstruct the enterprises uh, through all, what, eight of them, there are things that I would do as... Um, as a, as a starting conversation. One, NAPI. Right now, everyone's talking about food sovereignty. There was a time during the pandemic when I was sitting in the president's office and I started to notice that water was running out, obviously toilet paper was gone, but then next it was eggs and then it was meat. And then there was a point in time where we kind of sat back and thought, whoa, we've got a problem here in terms of whether or not the supply for groceries, the supply chain, the supply route is gonna crash. So we got on the phone with Region 9, USDA, FDIPR, Food Distribution for Indian Reservation Programs, and we had to get assurances and commitments that there was enough of a food, uh, uh, access to food supplies to keep the Navajo Nation fed in the event that we had a crash of the supply food chain to the Navajo grocery stores. That brought up a really interesting conversation about just where are we as Navajo people? Can we feed ourselves, right? I can't feed myself. I don't have a cornfield. I don't, well, actually, I got a number of sheep and cattle and horses, but when it comes down to actually being able to feed ourselves in the conversation of food sovereignty, no. We're in dire straits. So NAPI could be in the position to support micro farms or some sort of a co-op farming system within the Navajo Nation among individual Navajo people hey, look, they're growing hay out there, right? Well, why can't my neighbor down the way by the you know, access of the alluvial aquifer access water to grow their own hay, which Nappy would purchase from him? And you have through, what, four, five, six cuttings based on how much water you've got through a growing season throughout the summer? You know how much money that individual person is gonna make based on a co-op system where Nappy buys hay from them? Well, let's go ahead and expand that to hay, to corn, to watermelons, to potatoes, to onions. And if you could imagine the Navajo Nation communities and hundreds of different co-op farmers growing product, produce that NAPI would purchase and utilize their access to market to sell, great. Well, let's go ahead and pair that up with Navajo Shopping Centers Incorporated. Why can't we establish a situation where fresh produce is purchased during the growing season by bashes or by lows, thereby creating a market for people to grow stuff and to sell them? Those are the creativity things that I'm talking about here. Navajo Broadcast, look, man, we are getting pounded every single day over the fact that we don't have an up and running broadcast system, utilizing the World Wide Web to the fullest extent possible, talking about the fabulous, successful, wonderful stories that are happening in our communities as a part of pushing back against historical trauma. There's also these things about NECA. What about vertical construction? These guys are great at building dams and roads. Let's go vertical. Let's put NHA in competition with them for grants on building structures. That would have been amazing. We look at, what else? Hospitality. Let's link these guys up with Navajo people out there in some of the most beautiful areas on the Navajo reservation, provide some funding for them to build that beautiful picturesque hogan everybody wants to sleep in, right? And then create a network of them throughout the Navajo nation. Compare, you know, have brochures here at Navajo Gaming, having sponsorship for people to go out onto the Navajo nation to experience what it is to live or to sleep in a hogan or to have access to traditional foods or knowledge from people that are growing them at home because there's an incentive because NAPI is going to be buying it from them or perhaps even the Navajo grocery stores or even the restaurant systems within the Navajo Nation will be purchasing it from them. You see how it all kind of works together? Oil and gas. Yeah, I'd say let's work with what we got in place, but let's talk about refining. You want to have sovereignty in Navajo oil and gas? You got to have a refinery. Send Navajo oil to a Navajo refinery, send that gas back into the gas stations here, 
create a system where you're basically selling your own gas at a much lower and reduced price. That might work, right? Shopping centers, again, fruits are Novo times. Let's do publishing Tuesdays and Thursdays. News and development are occurring every day at a faster pace And how long have they been printing Navajo Times every Thursday, right? That's a boring, same old story. Tuesday and Thursdays, expand distribution and advertisement, not only to 60,000 Navajos, but to 120,000 Navajos twice a week. NTOA, so here's another thing. Enterprises have a very unique skill set Electricians, engineers, welders, carpenters, right? Well, why can't we pair up the enterprises with trade unions to create a specific type of educational trade program where Navajo people go over there, learn how to become welders, electricians, linemen, learn how to maintenance um, gaming uh, equipment, learn how to, you know, figure out, you know, whatever the trades are, carpentry, et cetera. And you're generating what essentially is going to be your next professional generation of tradespeople. Now, you pair that up with the $2.8 billion Navajo's got, with the possibility of another couple of hundred million dollars from the Infrastructure Act coming through. Guess where your employment pool is going to come from for Navajo infrastructure development from the very same people that you would train for electricians, welding, carpenter, et cetera. It's regenerating this professional generation of people to contribute to the infrastructure development within Navajo Nation, utilizing your Navajo federal funds for ARPA and CARE, paying your Navajo communities for the development of infrastructure in those communities. The other thing that I was thinking about, though, is technology, right? The enterprises have such a beautiful access to technology. Technology restructures, redefines, recreates, redetermines, re, you know, it just... When we think about the traditional scope of marketing, access to the market, of commercial um, products and services, the internet destroys all of the traditional principles of business development, which is location and access to market. Now you're at a regional level, or you're at a local level, now with the internet, you're going to go global, right? It's like that ZZ Top song, I'm international now, right? National wide. So then the final thing is this. If we're going to make a difference here for the next five years, for the next 10 years, we got to reconstruct the conversation in radically different ways because what's worked in the past 50 years, hey, that was great for its time and frame. We got it there. We've done it. But what's going on now globally, nationally, internationally, it's different. We have to look at it with a brand new set of eyes and with some courage and creativity and some guts. Let's do it, you know? But you need leadership to have the vision and the dream and the do how. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Parrish, I, I know, I know it's a, a, a kind of unique situation for gaming, but you know, take a stab at answering the question. Mr. Watchman, thank you, sir. Um, the challenges that Navajo's facing are the same as the other tribes that I've worked with, and I have a lot of colleagues working elsewhere in Indian country. Uh, all of Indian country has the same challenges with creating their own economic interdependence and self-sufficiency. The states have it, every community has that. Uh, the way we're gonna get there is arm in arm and doing it together. Uh, every different enterprise, I think, has a role that it can play. Government is very important for making sure that things are fair and equitable. There's Navajo preference in employment law, uh, which is a critical part of how we manage our business every single day. Uh, you also have the Navajo Nation procurement law, which is a very robust body of law. And you also have the Navajo Nation Business Compliance Office, uh, which is part of the Division of Economic Development that is there responsible for monitoring and enforcing and guiding enterprises and making good decisions and making sure that priority one and priority two vendors are, are being given the opportunity. Uh, so we have to advertise projects in the newspaper, uh, request for qualifications and proposals and things like that. And then we, if we get priority one vendors that are qualified, we can't look at anybody else. It uh, doesn't matter what the pricing is. If we have priority two vendors but not priority one that are qualified and can do the project, we can't look any further. We stop right there. So there is a lot of legislation and, and laws and policy in place to help with that. 
I think that what we have to do is figure out how to come together and who's going to serve what role and how do we create this economic interdependence within the Navajo Nation, but we can't, I say we, I apologize, uh, but you know, you, we can't be an island. We still have to interact with uh, border towns and, and other areas and communities to get goods and services that we can't provide for ourselves. That being said, Mr. Bluehouse brings up some excellent ideas and thoughts about how we work together to leverage the resources that we have. And so I think that that's definitely where these discussions can go very positively and constructively. We want to create a rising tide effect, that as the, rise, the tide rises, all the boats sitting in the water rise too, and everybody gets a chance to participate. That means that, uh, you know, everybody's got to work hard, have quality products that are authentic, they stand by them with guarantees, and we work together to market them and play to our strengths, which is the Navajo culture, the Navajo people, and the authenticity in the products that you're creating. And same thing with our enterprise. We developed the Navajo Fizz Craft Soda Company. That's not competitive with any businesses that we're aware of on Navajo, but it, we're going head to head with all these different companies that are producing beverages. We want to go ahead and move into water that we bottle for the whole nation, get into teas, craft sodas, all kinds of other things, and continue to grow that business. That soda, when people try that and they go, wow, this is all authentic, it comes from the Navajo Nation, the recipe, the products, they're all purchased from Nappy and other Navajo Nation owned and, and uh, enterprises. Wow, this is really good. And that helps reinforce this, what, the, what Navajo is, which is amazing and remarkable and resilient and very rich in its culture. Our jerky program, which Mr. Bluehouse uh, also mentioned, and, and I promise I didn't give him that information before we came in here. He was gracious enough to share that, but you know, we're, we're purchasing tremendous amounts of Navajo beef and we're pulling, pulling more cattle, trying to through that, uh, that raising and grazing process so we can sell more. We've got a partnership with Hard Rock International, which is owned by the Seminole Tribe of Florida. They're our sports betting partners. We want them to take on Navajo uh, beef products in their new property that they're building, which used to be the Mirage in Las Vegas. So now all of a sudden, you've got Navajo beef that was limited really to the Hatazil chapter, and now it's going all over Navajo, now it's going into Vegas, in some of the best steakhouses in that, in that area. These are things that we can do to help ourselves and help our sister enterprises grow and develop and continue to take care of the, the Navajo people and their families. So there's ways to do this. There's ways to do it, and we have to come together as a community and do it together. And so uh, I apologize. I am I am not Dene, uh, and uh, on both sides I get a hard time about that because oh your you know your families are interrelated and everything. Uh, but my dad's side of the family is upstate New York, and my mom's from Boston, and so um, not the case. But I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and serve the Dene community. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. So, I guess, where are we at? Uh, I think we heard that there is value from enterprises. If we start from scratch, do we continue with the enterprise model? And so, but in, in our question, in, in the pamphlet here, it says, what needs to be done to ensure that Navajo communities benefit from its enterprises? And so, uh, I, I think we're kind of speaking to that. Uh, in, in different terms, but let's see if we can answer this question. What needs to be done to ensure that Navajo communities, and, and you can define that however you want, Navajo communities benefit from its enterprises. And so, you know, we're, we're taking that assumption that all of our assets are held in common, so we as Navajos, you know, for the most part, have, have a relationship with our enterprises. So uh, let's, let's take that question on. And who would like to start first to answer? <laughs> Brian, well, we go ahead. He's first is okay. <laughs> oh, I think you pass it that way. So Brian, go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Watchman, sir, thank you. Um, the relationships with the communities is very, very important, especially for our enterprise. 
Uh, there's a lot of things that we do uh, to try to continue to create benefits going back to uh, our host chapters. Uh, we had a meeting with the Church Rock chapter this morning, a long conference call, and we talked about a few of the things that they're facing in the way of challenges and how do we marry those up to help solve those problems and help ourselves at the same time. So again, that rising tide effect. Uh, they're having challenges with the, uh, the water pipeline coming in. They can't, there's no availability of, of the ducting and the piping to be able to complete the water line. That's really, really tough for them. We're looking at what we do with our permanent fire rock facility in that location and how do we build it and how do we create more need and demand to figure out how we can get uh, possession of that piping so we can keep, uh, the, get the purchase that piping so the project can be completed. Another one is roadway safety projects. That Highway 118 along the front of Fire Rock that runs uh, east and west right past uh, the Church Rock area. Um, that's a very narrow road and it's not well lit. Our enterprise partnered with uh, the New Mexico Senators. Ms. Profilia Bradley's in the back. She was one of our warriors going in there, ABBA, and uh, battled for us to get money from the state of New Mexico to create a widening project with lighting at, at uh, uh, Highway 118. Uh, so that is a critical project. They've actually, along with Michelle Dotson, Ms. Profilia Bradley, also got us money for a project up at uh, Northern Edge with N37, or, or 371 and N36, and then also I think it's at Highway 64, 65 in front of flowing water. They went and got that money from the state to create roadway safety projects that benefit the community and it also helps our enterprise. But more often than not, also things like the, the uh, cattle ranching program is a great opportunity. Now, Hatazil is not a host chapter for us, but there are ranchers all over that area. And so we're finding ways to uh, utilize those products and services and make sure that we market them well and that we can sell them in our properties and then expand that so they can continue to grow. Uh, we've got other projects and products that we're developing right now that are non-gaming. So there's tons of opportunity uh, for the communities to participate in some of those things. Jewelry sales is another big one. Art, you can go all over this property and see all the, the authentic Navajo Nation art that was created uh, inside this building and selling prints and, and communicating what that art means. And then also another project that we're working on, and I apologize for racing through these a little bit, is our own mobile application that ties back to Hard Rock International. Hard Rock International is the 11th most well-known brand in the entire world. Anywhere you go, there's Hard Rock facilities and people know what that product is. By partnering with the Navajo Nation, it puts us more on equal footing and it gives us a chance to showcase what Navajo is. And so that is our goal. We envision a mobile app that has artisans on there and a Navajo marketplace, not just gaming, hotels, restaurants, jewelry, rug weaving, anything that we're, is being sold that's authentic Navajo can be in this marketplace and on this mobile app. If you go out to the Navajo Blue Travel Plaza, we have a totem in there with four different touch screens. Carl Jim was the developer of this concept. And what it is, it's an interactive display where you can download information to your cell phone or your PC, and it tells you all about stories on Navajo and code talkers and uh, what does eh mean and all these different things, but it also is a chance to cross-market businesses. And what we want to do is expand that program all over Navajo and have these other businesses be able to get on these, these systems, these networks. And so when people are coming to Navajo, they come in and they say, wow, what do I want to see? What do I want to do? What do I want to experience? They go to artisans and they look at jewelry. Up pops a picture of the artisan. It's his history. And it talks about his inspiration and, and Navajo and what connects him to his artwork. And that connects the artwork to the people that buy it. So One there's minute. tons of different things that we can... One minute, Brian. Thank you, sir, that we're working on and that we can go into with this. And we need everybody to come together. We've started a sign-up list, and we're starting meetings on getting people involved in this project. But again, it's something that gives everybody an opportunity to participate in the rising tide effect. And when people come from off Navajo and they have a wonderful experience, they're going to take that home and they're going to tell people. That is the best word of mouth advertising we can get. 
So we're anxious to talk to you more about these things. There's huge opportunity. There's more that we can do. It's just all of us coming together and, and, and doing it as one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Mr. Bluehouse or Ms. Davies, what needs to be done to ensure that Navajo communities benefit from its enterprises? Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Derek. Um, so here's a small story. A couple of years back, I was over at Cornfields Chapter House, and the conversation was about addressing domestic violence in the community, right? And so all of these different types of community members showed up, and they were all talking about domestic violence problems and stuff. And so we had Navajo Social Services, Navajo Law Enforcement, and different, you know, governmental services come in. And it was a directive conversation. It was more or less, we are from these programs, and we are going to do these things for you kind of a thing. Well, I kind of thought that was interesting because it kind of follows along the same script that um, a paternalistic federal program would, you know, essentially create and establish in tribal communities. We are the experts. We're here to do these things for you, and it should work out, right? Well, during the conversation, I asked the community members. I said, well, well one thing I heard in all of these, I, had, I did not hear in all of these conversations was, why do you, why do you love your community? And people began to begin realizing, well, it has history here. My grandparents were here. Uh, my children were born here. Uh, my grandparents and my relatives who passed are buried over there. Suddenly we began to develop this, this conversation about what they loved in their communities. And then we talked about another conversation. Throughout all of that, we never talked about, we, we love our families, we love one another, we love our children, we love our grandparents. It's this conversation that I think, in a sense, to answer the question for Danae, um, enterprises supporting communities is that sometimes we have to approach the conversation from the community's perspective first. What are the issues in the communities that need to be addressed? And you'll be surprised what you hear out there. The presumption is, yeah, it might be this particular issue that we're facing on domestic violence, on substance abuse, etc. But there's a sub-conversation to that. Why are the issues present? When we get to that sub-issue area, that's when we can begin talking about the resources needed to address the issues in our communities. And those are the resources that the enterprise, enterprises have in abundance, both in terms of the technical knowledge, the skilled employees, access to market, capital, financing. So then when we think about that, what does it look like for community support from our enterprises in funding, supporting and establishing a network of victims, crimes advocates to address the pandemic of murdered and missing Diné relatives? What about addressing the issues of education and scholarships? Yes, they do that. But what about internship systems that follow them through their so freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year that culminates with a job at the end of their time in college? It could do that for medical school, it could do that for uh, law school, it could do that for M MBA programs. What about the different types of child care programs that could be developed for single mothers who can't go to work because they've got to watch kids? How do we pool those resources to create child care systems within our tribal communities so that single mothers can at least get out and work, provide for their families? This young lady in Gallup right now living at the hotel there taking care of three kids that she can't work. Her husband's in jail. And, you know, she does the Facebook thing and everybody helps to contribute to that. But that's a temporary patch. What's the long-term patch for that? Child care services. What about farmer's market and flea market systems? Man, I'm tired of seeing Ganado flea market, that bombed out piece of dirt right there across from the, from the post office. Well, why can't we access the enterprises to create a fund to at least get somebody out there with some plows and some gravel out there, create a nice, beautiful place to sell all your used cowboy boots, which, by the way, that's where I bought these. And so those are the things that, you know, I think about in terms of what the enterprises can do for community development. What about business support? These guys are experts, man. Talk to Mr. Mr. Um, Jim here about marketing. Well, what knowledge does he have that can help small businesses out on the Navajo Nation in a series of classes for small businesses? how to be visually appealing, how to sell your market, how to identify the challenges, how to, you know, those kinds of things. 
What about micro loans to small businesses? Loans of $500 because I need a computer so that I can do my small business on graphics and uh, marketing, et cetera, for other businesses. Maybe it's a micro loan because, hey, I just need to buy a barbecue grill so I can grill up some really great steaks down there at the flea market on every Saturday after payday. Which, by the way, if you go to the flea market between paydays, yeah, you're not knowledgeable. You're going to lose money. You got to hit it. Big time is when payday hits on the first of the month or close to that, that next Saturday is when you're out there. Right? People sell. That's what I'm saying. They know the flow of money in our communities. But the resources that enterprises have, developing a training system for small businesses on marketing, on bookkeeping, developing a support system for the trades that I talked about earlier in connection with trade unions. Yeah. Everything really kind of is possible when you think about, about what it means to dream. And when you think about the people in our community who are so worthy and so deserving of an opportunity to work, to provide for their families. And so when you think about the connection of the heart with the ability of the mind and the opportunities using the resources of enterprises to create jobs for people at home, that is kind of the business I'm in here. And I think that those are the things that can be helpful for Navajo communities through the use of the resources that enterprises have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bluehouse. Ms. Davies, what needs to be done to ensure that Navajo communities benefit from its enterprises? How, mu how much time do I have? <laughs> oh, I've been given seven minutes, everybody, so. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, that's, a, that's a really great question, and I think in my capacity as the chair for the Diné Chamber of Commerce, I'm going to always bring it back to supporting Navajo businesses. And the way enterprises can help in their communities is we need to revisit how all of the enterprises interact together, right? So we've got a utility, we've got an arts and crafts enterprise, we've got a hospitality <laughs> enterprise, we've got an agricultural enterprise. All, all eight of these enterprises, what do they do and what are their, their what do the projects do? What, are, what do they do? So say for instance, NECA is building, you know, they get the contract for a, restoring the highway out to Blue Gap, right? Are they hiring local people in Blue Gap? No, they're not. They're bringing in contractors out of Gallup and K-Town and Flagstaff, and these are not, most of them are non-Navajo businesses. So we, my biggest concern is that the enterprises, in order to give back communities, need to reevaluate how their, their products, the, the things that these enterprises produce, how are those actually benefiting communities? And all of these enterprises require goods and services. They need suppliers. And as I said before, we have got a lot of Navajo businesses out there that can do that. From farmers, local farmers, again, um, um, JR touched on that with NAPI, doing co-ops. Um, I feel this, this, the idea of helping local communities is, has to start from the local community. What are their needs? We need to identify those things. And we, we really haven't in terms of growing our economy and our enterprises have played a, a role in that, but they don't, they don't bring things down to the local community. And I, I, I'm using Blue Gap chapter as an example because it's remote. It's, or, or let's say White Rock. When's the last time you went to Torium? Right? I mean, what, what's out there? You might have a gas station 20 miles down from the chapter house, but that's it. So how do we get money, how do we get economy to those smaller communities? And I think the enterprises in their roles need to reevaluate how they're doing that, if they're participating in that at all. 
And I think many of them aren't. They really don't do that. They benefit the enterprise. And yes, they give back, they put funds back in. If you go to NECA's website, all they have is a list of all of the money they've gotten over time. And then some of the taxes that they've paid, they show that. And then one line is, we've given back 1.3 or 1.7 million dollars to the community. Yeah, but you've made 1.3 billion dollars. You gave back less than 1% to the communities that you work in and you're proud. I have a problem with that. So I think it's gonna require some re-evaluation. I think we need the support of our leaders, our council, the office of the president, as well as the directors of all of the divisions. There's a, there's a, a lack of a, a vision of how we're, it's all interconnected. We've, we've brought up our, our government and the way we function, it's very compartmentalized. Nobody wants to share any, any duties. That's my, that's my role. I do the roads. I do the cows. I do the arts and crafts. All of that is interrelated on a community level. You have communities, you have artisans, craftspeople, agriculturalists, people who have Airbnbs at, up in K-Town and Monument Valley. All of these people need to benefit if the enterprises are gonna be part of our, part of our economy. All of those people need to benefit. And right now, our enterprises, I don't see that they do that except for giving back maybe to the general fund or whatever they, however they, that mechanism works. Um, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be reevaluated. And, uh, and again, we talked about tearing down the system. Maybe we need to do that, but people are afraid of change. We get that, but the Dinette Chamber of Commerce is, our main mission is to grow a long-term, sustainable Navajo economy. And defining what that is, is the tricky part. What is that? So when you go, do you remember atlases? Printed atlases, and when you were little and you'd open it up and there'd be Nigeria, and there'd be the map, and then they might have a couple of different overlays, and they'd show the economy of Nigeria. And it would have the number one export listed. And it might be cotton or something. I, I don't know, I'm just making all that up, but what is it for Navajo? We, haven't, we don't even talk about that. What, 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 do we, what do we do as Navajo businesses? We have artisans, craftspeople, tourism, and agriculture, farming. We're not gonna have a Walmart in Chinle. That's, that's, that's not gonna work. Everybody, if we had a Walmart in Chin Lee, everybody's still going to go to Gallup. They're still going to come to Flag. Why? Because they're not only needing Walmart, they need a barber. They need, they need a, a tax shop. They need gas. They need all these other things that are not there in Chin Lee. So everybody's, oh, let's get a Walmart in Chin Lee. Let's put one in K-Town. They won't work because it doesn't fit our culture, our lifestyle. So anyways, I, I can be on my soapbox for a very long time. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Liddell. Um, interesting responses to and some interesting questions, so thank you. So what I'm hearing, it, to me, in, in, in the day, enterprises had maybe two missions, or one of two missions, either provide jobs, or provide their profits to their mother government. I think if you look at Indian country, that's been kind of the history. What I'm hearing today is kind of more interaction and sharing your knowledge. Maybe I'll call it technology transfer. And so that, that seems to be maybe a new way of thinking. And so uh, I've seen other tribes have all of their enterprises under one roof, and they have a, a council of enterprises, and I see others where there is some coordination. And so, so the, the, the question that, that I'm gonna ask here is that, 
Is there a need and why for consideration of consolidating our Navajo enterprises? Because um, if you look at it, there's some, we do have some mission creep. I heard, I heard that maybe it's good, um, but I'm sure maybe some folks are saying it's not good. So, um, so how, how do we address that, that issue? So I'll throw it out there, you know, if anybody wants to answer it now. So no particular order. Yeah, Go great. Ahead, so just to recap the question, is there a need to organize our enterprise systems underneath one management structure, essentially? Yeah, well, should we? Yeah. Is, yeah. is, that, is that worth considering? And, and will that bring more? Because what I'm trying to get to is, yeah. will, will that bring more accountability? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Will that bring more uh, uh, involvement and work with the communities? Um, and so basically, uh, an iron hand. So is there a need for... You know some consolidation or, or not so I, I'm interested yeah. in your answers on that yeah I do believe that there is um, a need in terms of the vision that I would have for growing diversifying and then applying the resources from en uh, enterprises into tribal communities and the co-op systems for whether agriculture or whether um, it would be for housing and hospitality or whether it's for um, the procurement of services or products from Navajo community members etc or even within a training um, system that I envision for um, the trades, electricians, welding, carpentry, et cetera, heating, cooling. Um, the, the dream that, that I have, the division that I have to accomplish those things, it almost necessarily means that we have to have a consolidated management system of the enterprises themselves in order to ensure accountability and progress and momentum on that particular vision. Right now, we do have, what, multiple enterprise oversight committees composed of representatives of the council, representatives from the executive office, meeting on staggered dates at different times and places. And yes, that's great for the operations as they currently are and the growth that they're doing. But for something to be as extensive and as radical and as sustained and focused over the course of, say, two years, for this thing to really generate ben benefit tribal members and communities, it must have an organized structure where it is consolidated underneath leadership. Now, the thing is that there's also the political interplay here, and um, Lydell talked to this earlier, is that when you have differences within the legislative body versus the executive um, president's offices, over policy discourse or over the utilization of expanded lines of credits for enterprises, for example, NTUA, during the last year or so. Um, those, those political differences, uh, for whatever they may be driven by, um, essentially prolong the conversation and do not benefit the Navajo members who are employed, single mothers who are seeking to provide for their families. Um, it, it just is not the case that that works for them. Look at what happens with CARE funding and ARPA funding. We have millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars waiting to be allocated. But because there's a differences in terms of what the allocation focus should be, we have a stalled network. And so the problem here is that with what we see in a diversified and almost sort of, um, how would you say it, uh, a fiefdom, little tiny kingdoms of enterprises out there, with many different types of oversight authorities um, running on different scheduled times and meetings, et cetera. It seems to me that we don't have the momentum, the focus, the drive, the sustained effort to make this dream happen underneath its current structure. So by necessity, we have to have it consolidated underneath a management system whereby Navajo leadership understand the benefit for the community members as the driving motivation to set aside their political differences or differences on, on the application or reallocation of those resources. Because look, I'm sorry to say this, but the politics related to ARPA has cost lives. There's no way else to put it. We stalled on providing PPEs. We stalled on ensuring that Navajo members had the resources necessary to get through this pandemic. And there were people that got sick about it. There were people who died from it, okay? This politics of division, this politics of, 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 of maybe individuality sometimes, 
it is detrimental and it is devastating and it is not the Navajo way when we think about the principles of the idea of relatives, the idea of the holisticness of our sovereignty. That is not Navajo way, that what we see in the fights that go on. And so for this dream and for this vision of the enterprise supporting a very diversified, very dynamic reallocation of resources, not only in terms of capital and funding, but also in the access of the training, the employment, you know, the, the co-op systems for farm and food sovereignty, that is going to need a, a consolidated system of management with a unified leadership uh, structure in place. Time's up. Who's next? <laughs> So getting back to the question, you know, is, is there a need, should we consolidate um, our enterprises or not, and, and the benefits from that? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Derek. I, I, th I think consolidating the enterprises could work, but again, I go back to separating government from business. And if we, if we had our enterprises all under one umbrella, it would be critically important to have, to make sure that there, that it's not managed by government. We need people in those positions who understand business. And right now, our, I mean, I, I, I know a lot of times we have, all we have is criticism of our government and, and, uh, you know, bless our leader's heart, like Mr. Nate Brown, who was here. I don't see him anymore, but maybe he was, maybe he ran away because he felt like we were beating up on government. But I really do believe that we, um, that our government needs to govern and our business entities need to do business. If bringing all of the enterprises under one umbrella helps accomplish that, then I think um, that would that would work, but again, I, I, I think it's going to take a lot of critical thinking with new ideas um, and bold steps to make sure that our enterprises are uh, giving back to the community. And what that structure, what form that structure takes, that's really hard to decide. I mean, that's a, that's a tricky question. Um, but it's something that we, we all should think about, in particular our leaders. And I, I agree wholeheartedly uh, with my brother here about um, the division, the politics of division. We have to overcome that. That is not our way. And um, it is, for Navajo businesses, if any of our Navajo businesses are uh, lucky enough to get any of the ARPA funding, how many of them are going to succeed right now when they only have less, you know, barely over two years to accomplish these projects when they should have had four? And it's, you know, now it's just, it's just making it harder and harder. The more we argue about who's going to get what, it's, in the end, I think what's going to happen is we're just going to end up doing a third round of hardship funding because one side of the street can't agree with the other side of the street and... So it's, you know, it's, it's not going to work, which is not, you know, it's, that's sad to say, but I, I, I feel like we might be headed in that direction. But again, some critical thinking, some bold steps, that might work. Thank you. Mr. Parrish, I, I know, again, you've you got a unique situation, but I'm curious, you mentioned your work with other tribes in any country, so, you know, what... I guess we're speaking to what, what would be an ideal business model for our enterprises. Thank you, sir. And I really respect and appreciate the, uh, the views and thoughts and experiences and opinions of, of the panelists up here. Uh, everybody's leading with their hearts and, and offering information that they believe in, and so uh, it's a privilege to be up here. Um, I think that it really has to start with the needs of the people and then we have to come together as enterprises and businesses and people and figure out how we can create plans and proposals we can work on together to satisfy those needs. 
And so there's a lot of different ways that we can go about doing that. Uh, but it, it really starts with what are our goals and objectives? And we want to make sure that for our enterprise, when we do our strategic planning with our board, our goals and objectives for the growth of the enterprise have to align with the needs of the Navajo Nation. And if it starts there, then we're going to be able to get the support we need from leadership so that we can move those projects forward. Once we know what our goal and objective is, look out. We have an amazing team. We're going to take that hill. We're going to figure out how to get it done. But we want to do it arm in arm with everybody. And so the key thing is, is a clear goal and objective tied to the needs of the Diné people and the long-term needs of the Navajo Nation. And then how do we as businesses and, and people come together to, to bring our strengths, work together as a unit to figure out how to drive that. Carl wrote down a note here, one strategy. Uh, and, and that's exactly right. It's got to be something that links us all together. And so I think the hard part about some consolidation and things is that every enterprise is very different, different tech uh, ex uh, technologies, different expertise, different experiences and things like that. You can learn great leadership and management skills, but does your knowledge transfer from, you know, gaming to NECA or hospitality to NAPI and things like that? It may not do that. Let those experienced people groom and develop the, their team members underneath them so we create sustainable, long-term, healthy businesses because healthy businesses is, are good for the Navajo Nation. We want to be successful. We want to be self-sustaining. We want to be interdependent. We want to work well with each other. And if it's just like any part of the economy, uh, there may be one industry that's really suffering, but there's others that are taking off and really doing well. So having diversification uh, is a good thing. That's healthy. And so I, th I think there's so much knowledge in this room, there's ways to come up with that, come up with some plans that tie back to the needs, we establish a clear objective, everybody aligns on it, and then we get behind it together and we work arm in arm to achieve it. And uh, Mr. Watchman, sir, thank you for the opportunity to share some of this information. Can I invite Mr. Jim to offer some thoughts as well, please, please sir? Please, go ahead, Carl Jim. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Jim, Director of Brand Management for Navajo Gaming. I've been with the enterprise for roughly 13 years and um, basically was this tall when I first started here and now I'm like right here. But I'm originally from Crown Point, New Mexico. I graduated from Northern Arizona in 2000 and then officially got my degree in 2016. But one of the, 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 the great opportunities I was I was blessed with was to work with the enterprise. I got to work under uh, Mr. Watchman and Mr. Parrish, and I see a few coworkers here, but the, the big thing, um, I think what, what would really help is if for some reason if we could be able to spend one week to two weeks with our leaders and business leaders and just dream and talk about all the things that we want for Navajo, all the pitfalls and all the different strategies that we have. But the idea behind that is this thing that we talk about of what, what, what we're learning from different enterprises right now because of technology, we, we're starting to get this data, this, all this data from, from various websites. If we can collect all of that data, then it's no more genetic. It's facts. We use these facts as, as a whole nation and start road mapping it out, saying this is what you do best, these are your pitfalls, these are our pitfalls, but just getting everybody in the room together. If we can go to Vegas for conferences, for three, four days, let's do three or four of those in a row on Navajo, get everybody's ideas together, and then see what we can do from there. And I'm thinking maybe two, three months from now, start of the new Navajo New Year, we, you can get a plan for the next 15 to 30 years and just start checking off the checklist, see, who's, see, who, see who can do what. I don't know. It just seems simple in my head, but if we could just get past these silos, 
then it, I think it would benefit the whole, the whole, all of us as a nation. Thank you, Carl. Very, very interesting comments here. Again, you know, we're not trying to solve anything. We're just trying to get some ideas generating here. I heard data, I heard uh, consolidated, I heard business model, business planning, job creation, extension of services. We're almost done here, but I'll, I'll give you one minute each to have a parting thought, comment, concern, uh, a Yahoo or whatever. <laughs> One minute, so I'll start with Milton. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to first of all appreciate um, Derek Watchman for inviting me up here. It's always been my dream to sort of share these crazy ideas that I have and to inspire people but also be inspired as well. I just want to thank that all the folks who are out there. You know, every day there's many bigger challenges you're going through, and I go through them as well. I know what it means to hold water at midnight, I know what it means to, you know, take care of family members who are having problems with substance abuse, I know what it means to sometimes resign myself and just say, hey, the only thing you can do for your relatives is just love them. You know? And so all of those things I think when we bring together the conversations of idealism, of dreaming, of visions, combined with what we go through in our daily lives, the vision, the, the picture that I see is much more pronounced about just how beautiful the future would look like with so much opportunity and so much blessings for each and everyone in our families. To address the things like MMDR, to address the things like substance abuse, domestic violence, unemployment to address the issues that both contemporary and long-term historical trauma has created in our families and our communities, right? It's an, I really what we're talking about it, it's, it's an opportunity to heal ourselves through economic means. And it's also, I think, a way to redefine how we develop ourselves economically. Do we replicate the systems that have worked in Albuquerque and Phoenix and Al you know, uh, Salt Lake City Center? The thing is that we've got to do it our own way. But that one's going to on this last one. All roads lead to Chaco Canyon. It's a play, I think, off the words, all roads lead to Rome, which means that there are many different paths to get to that objective, that one place. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the coalition and Heather, Derek, everybody um, who was involved in putting this together. It's um, it's always good for us to get together and to talk. It's who we are, how we do it. And um, sometimes we can go on and on and on, but that's okay, that's, that's how we get it done. And listening and learning um, from others is essential to this process and it's essential to making progress and so for, again, I'll bring it back to the Diné Chamber of Commerce and our role and our mission to advocate for Navajo businesses and a long-term sustainable economy on the Navajo Nation is, that's, that's what I, um, I hope we can do and that's what I hope we're contributing toward. And again, thank you all of you on the panel here um, and the uh, previous panels for participating in this. It's very, very important. And I, I hope all of you in the audience got something out of it today. Yeah. Mr. Parrish. Uh, yes, sir. Um, last thought I guess I'd just like to offer is just uh, unity and together we progress. And that's the only way it's going to work. Uh, fragmentation doesn't work and focusing on what I don't have or what others do and things like that, that's, that's not going to get us where we need to be as a community. And I'm not to that, but I get to support this community and, and I'm fully emotionally engaged in doing that. And I know that the stronger we come together as, as people and, and, and family and, and business family and everybody else, we're going to figure this out. There are tremendous resources and the smartest, best people on the Navajo Nation. There's no reason why we can't solve these issues working together. And so I uh, just really, really encourage that. Nobody has all the answers. Nobody does, but together we can figure it out. So I get it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's give our panelists a big, big round of applause. So we're, we're at the end of our uh, forum today, and I want to thank our speakers. So with that, I want to say thank you so, so much for our forum.
So let's give everybody a round of applause.